Greetings and welcome to this edition of Positronic Hypersonic. I'm Barry P. Cook. I'm here to give you my review of Lightyear. You know, I wasn't the biggest and haven't been the biggest Toy Story fan in the world, although I did watch at least the first two movies. I might have seen the third one, I don't remember. I, I know I didn't see the fourth one, but I, I have liked those movies well enough, you know, and I think both the Buzz Lightyear character and the Woody character are hilarious. So I've, I've enjoyed those two characters very much. So I was interested to see this movie because, you know, it's basically the origin story of Buzz Lightyear. I wasn't in any kind of rush to see it though. So I probably wouldn't have seen it yet if it weren't for the controversy surrounding it. And not only the controversy, but the fact that it hasn't done well, apparently. So I thought, you know, I have to check this movie out and see for myself what the heck is going on. Because, you know, Toy Story and Buzz Lightyear and all that are huge draws. And I couldn't have imagined this movie not doing well. On top of that, the trailer and the you know previews and all that I thought were really great. When I saw the, the trailer, I was like, wow, this looks like a pretty cool movie. I think I want to check that out. And I think I would have thought that even if it weren't Buzz Lightyear, as a matter of fact. It just looked like a good animated, lighthearted, space-based, you know, romp. So anyway, I did check it out. And I'm going to tell you what I thought of it. But let me just give you a brief plot rundown. And I say brief because... There's a lot of action in this movie and there's a lot of funny little scenes and I'm not gonna get into every detail. So it'll, it'll be brief compared to that. As it starts, we find Buzz and his best friend who also happens to be his commanding officer, Alicia Hawthorne, exploring a planet that I guess they thought was habitable called Takani Prime. And uh, they're also there with their new recruit, Featheringhamston. <laughs> if that's how you say it. <laughs> They're forced to retreat to their ship, though, after they discover that the planet is loaded with hostile life. Of course, this doesn't happen before Buzz does a lot of goofy stuff, including talking to the, the log recorder on his arm and recording a log, which Hawthorne thinks is hilarious. And at one point when he's speaking to the recruit he's kind of speechifying so she plays some music I guess from her suit to make it <laughs> to make fun of him and he turns and he goes you're mocking me aren't you so I thought that was very cool anyway Buzz actually damages the ship while they're trying to get off the planet and it forces the whole crew to you know evacuate the ship and a year later they've managed to construct a little bit of a colony and the necessary, you know, infrastructure to make the repairs. Buzz volunteers to test a new hyperspace vehicle and a new hyperspace fuel so that they can take the repaired ship into hyperspace and go home, which they can't do at present because when he damaged it, they broke their, I guess, fuel crystal that allows them to go to hyperspace and they didn't have a replacement, which is a little weird, you'd think ship that big because it's big there would be some kind of replacement anyway bygones <laughs> after the first four minute test flight when he arrives back on Takani Prime he finds that four years have passed for the rest of the crew due to the effects of time dilation so he goes back to his quarters and he gets introduced to Socks a robotic uh, cat who in this movie is hilarious you just hilarious character in this movie and he continues testing the hyperspace fuel over and over and every time there's a new test four more years pass until eventually turns out that he's gone so many times that it's been 62 years during that time the colony had developed Hawthorne raises a son with her wife Kiko and they celebrate their 40th anniversary even now this is the part of the movie where the two female characters, Kiko and Hawthorne, have a little bit of a kiss. There's a peck on the lips. And it's like a split second. But apparently, this 
caused a whole bunch of controversy in addition to the fact that you know they i mean it's the kiss plus they depict her with a woman kiss or no and she talks about being with a woman kiss or no so there's those two things there are those two things and then the actual kiss so you, you know that it's a woman to woman relationship and it's been controversial because of course not everybody's down with that in 2022 for some reason and they think it shouldn't be in a kids movie and of course other countries are even more up their butts about that stuff so i guess it was taken out of the movie in a couple of markets which is so dumb but anyway that's the part of the movie where that occurs and that's the context with which uh, it, within which it occurs if you didn't know and it's just so dumb that there was an issue over it anyway the last time he comes home I guess after the 62 years, I guess up until that point, Hawthorne was still alive. By the time he comes back, the last time, she's deceased. She dies of old age. But it also turns out that Sox has figured out how to get the fuel to work. So they don't have to keep doing test runs. They can actually use it and go back, you know, to Earth. But the new commanding officer, Commander Burnside, tells Buzz that in his last four-year absence, they've decided not to bother to try to go home anymore. That they're just going to exist there and that they've got some kind of a laser shield that's going to cover the base or whatever, and they're not going to worry about the hostile aliens. But Buzz doesn't like this idea. He wants to take everybody home. He wants to complete the mission. So he, takes, he steals the ship, basically, and tests the fuel and it works. And he actually makes it to hyperspace. But when he gets back, instead of it being four years gone by, it's 22 years gone by this time. And in that time, the planet has been invaded by Zyklops robots led by Zerg. So Zerg comes into the picture now. Buzz meets up with the members of the colony's defense forces, including Izzy Hawthorne, who is Alicia's now adult granddaughter, Mo Morrison, a fresh, naive recruit, and Darby Steele, an elderly, paroled convict. At first, he's reluctant to work with them, but he eventually warms to them, and together, they decide they're going to attack Zerg's ship and destroy the invading <laughs> robot forces. So, you know, there's all kinds of hijinks surrounding that, and it's pretty cool stuff. I thought some of it was kind of tacked on. It didn't feel organic to the plot. And so the movie kind of drags a little bit, but you know, it's, it's still good. Anyway, they go about this plan and it uh, winds up that Buzz gets abducted by Zerg. And once he has Buzz on his ship, he reveals that he is actually an older version of Buzz from an alternate timeline that I guess spawned when he landed and was actually caught by Burnside. So instead of landing where he landed far away from the base, you know, the young Buzz that we've seen for most of the movie, this older version, when still young, landed closer to the base, I guess, and was captured or was almost captured and then took off and it somehow spawned another timeline. I wasn't really clear on that. But anyway, there are two Buzzes. And it turns out that this Buzz ended up traveling to the far future where he came across an abandoned, technologically advanced ship. And so he goes back to the present that we've been seeing for the whole movie because he wants to get more hyperspace fuel from Buzz in order to travel even further back in time and prevent the exploration vessel from even landing onto Connie Prime in the first place. However, younger Buzz doesn't want to do that. He wants to complete the mission. He wants to get his friends home, you know, and the people at the base home and everything, but he doesn't want to do it in such a way that erases everything they've accomplished and the relationships that they've forged and the people who've been born. So he tells older Buzz to get bent, basically. While that's happening, Izzy, Mo, Darby, and Sox actually board the ship to try to assist Buzz. And they do end up sort of pulling it out where they all escape and destroy Zerg's ship. And it's kind of funny, by the way, the word Zerg apparently came about because the 
robots that older Buzz was commanding or working with or whatever couldn't say Buzz. So they, they said Zerg. I don't know. That's where that comes from. Anyway, Zerg survives uh, this explosion. He attacks Buzz and he grabs the hyperspace fuel. As he's just about to destroy Buzz, Buzz shoots the fuel, causing, to, uh, causing it to explode and incapacitate Zerg. And with the fuel gone, Buzz decides he wants to stay on Takani Prime. He's not going to keep trying to develop a hyperspace fuel so that the people can go back to Earth. He just decides, hey, this is a, a life now, and I'm going to stay here. So, of course, he still stole the spaceship, so he gets arrested, but Burnside decides he's not going to throw him the brig. He's going to get him to train a new version of the Space Ranger Corps, and he wants him to train a particular group, but Buzz says, no, I'm going to, I already have my team, and he decides to train Izzy, Mo, and Darby to be Space Rangers. Once that's done, there's a little bit of a flash forward, I guess, the team heads out on a new mission, and that's where the movie ends, at least the part of the movie before the credits. There are a couple of really, really short <laughs> post credit scenes, and the final one reveals that Zerg did not die in the explosion of the fuel. He survived. So, sequel? <laughs> I don't think that's gonna happen just because the movie didn't do very well, but it, we'll have to see. Uh, it's still out, so who knows, it may recoup enough money where they figure, okay, let's try again. I did like the movie. I thought it was funny, and there was good action. Like I say, there was maybe a little too much. Some parts, I think, could have been cut, but and I thought it had heart. You know, that's important, too. And it did have a good deal of heart, but it wasn't tear-jerky. It wasn't oversaturated, you know, with sappy moments. I just, you know, I thought it was well done. The, the characters are believable. Now, I, of course, would have liked it better, I think, if Tim Allen had done the voice of Buzz instead of Chris Evans, who, by the way, does an excellent job. But I guess he was never offered the part, maybe because Disney didn't like his politics. I don't know. That just doesn't make sense to me. You would think that, you know, he would do the voice because toy that's based on him in the Toy Story movies, you would think the voice would be the voice of the guy, like, I don't, you know, that's kind of weird, right? So I think it's unfortunate that Tim Allen didn't do the voice. And in fact, this was another controversy about the movie. People, I guess, didn't know this. So people were annoyed to the point where at least one theater had to put up a sign saying, yeah, by the way, Tim Allen does not do the voice. So that people would know it, you know, going in so they wouldn't come out and ask for a refund, I guess. So I think that was strange, you know, that that, that, that all happened. And, you know, I guess they also had to tell people on this one particular sign that the movie is a movie that represents the movie <laughs> that Andy from Toy Story saw as a young boy which caused him to be enamored with the Buzz Lightyear character and subsequently the toy. I knew that right away. Well, I knew right away it wasn't a movie about the toy. I knew it was the story of the guy that the toy was based on. So I knew that right away. I don't know why anybody would be confused about that. But, and, and I thought that's what, that was one of the appeals of it. So I don't know why that caused a problem for some people. That said, I don't know why they went out of their way to say that this movie is also a movie within the Toy Story universe. I don't think that was necessary. I think it would have been fine to say, here's the actual guy that did the actual stuff that inspired the toy. But I guess the problem with that is the Toy Story came out in 1995 and was set in what was the present. So how could you have a guy in real life who had done all those things and inspired a toy. So I guess it had to be a movie that was a movie, but even then, I don't think they had to go there. I think they could have just said that the toy was the originator, right? That the toy was the OG. And that, because toys get made up all the time, not from movies and stuff. And that the movie 
was just based, you know, on the toy that this was just a movie that depicts what it would be like if Buzz Lightyear were real and not just a toy. Because that's what I thought it was upon seeing the trailer, because it doesn't tell you in the trailer, oh, this is the movie that Andy saw. So I was like, oh, this is just Buzz Lightyear's story if he were real. I think they were trying to tie it into the actual Toy Story universe, but I don't think that was necessary. I think it could have stood on its own. It's not doing well, apparently, and it remains to be seen what will become of it. I think it's unfortunate. I think it was a good movie. It was enjoyable. You know, I wouldn't say it's anything fantastic, but I enjoyed it quite a bit. The funny parts are very funny, and it's just an enjoyable animated space adventure thing. So I would say, you know, check it out. If you're a fan of those types of movies, if you're a fan of the Buzz Lightyear character, go check it out. It's, it's a good film, and I think it deserves to do well, better than it's doing anyway. But that's really it. That's my review of Lightyear. I'm going to get out of here. I will be back, of course, with more movie reviews and other content soon. But until then, I take my leave, and of course, I wish you peace and long life. To infinity and beyond! <laughs>